Yes, hello everybody. I have some problems with starting my PowerPoint. I wanted to show a couple of slides, so I won't be able to do that. But let's um, start the webinar. First of all, say welcome to um, our guest lecturer of today, Runa Elvik. Uh, I don't think he needs a lot of uh, introduction. He has uh, published a lot in the field. Um, he has been um, a researcher at uh, the Transport Economic Institute in, in Oslo in Norway um, since uh, 1980, I believe. He has uh, published an, uh, an awful lot of uh, papers. Uh, we usually say that he publishes more than, than most of us can read sometimes. So he's really one of the uh, the major people, the major researchers in the field. And we are very glad to welcome here today him at the ICTCT uh, webinar. Also, welcome to all of you people that are attending the webinar. Um, the format, uh, as we have done it a couple of times already, is that we first have a lecture and afterwards there will be room for some questions. So um, I suggest that, uh, Rune, that you continue now, that you uh, uh, start the lecture. And then once you are ready with that, we will come back to you and uh, moderate the uh, session for the questions and answers. And um, uh, we hope to have uh, finished uh, more or less the webinar uh, in an hour. Uh, so uh, please uh, stay with us. Uh, until the end, uh, we will do some some more announcements then about activities of uh, ICTCT that are ongoing. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Yes, I hope you can all see my screen now and hear me. Yes. Fine. Thank you. Well. The title of this presentation is Standards of Knowledge and Quality of Road Safety Research. And the main question I'm asking is how much do we really know about what works in preventing traffic injury? Our standard of knowledge is, I believe, uh, easy to define. It follows I think directly from the aim of road safety evaluation research, which is to estimate the changes in road safety that were caused by a road safety measure or a set of road safety measures. You will note that I put the word caused in bold here because that is the most important word in this uh, sentence. And it means that we must show that the changes in road safety were caused mainly or exclusively by the measure and not by any of the other hundreds of factors that influence road safety and that can produce changes that we can mistake for being the effect of a road safety measure when in fact they are something totally different. As you uh, probably all know, the best way of establishing causality in an evaluation study is to do a randomized control trial or an experiment. Because if we do that, if we have a large sample, then randomization means that there will not be any systematic differences between the treatment group and the control group. The only difference, ideally speaking, will be the treatment that has been given to the treatment group. Last year, I tried to review how many experiments have been made with road safety measures and what their findings were. And there are actually very few experiments. Uh, my count, which is quite generous, I think, is that about 2.5% of the road safety evaluation studies that we refer to in the Handbook of Road Safety Measures are experiments, and the rest, 97.5%, are observational studies of different qualities. So some quite good, uh, others not so good. 
So the first thing I found is that there are few experiments that they are exceptional in the field of road safety evaluation. The second thing I found was that the results are in general quite disappointing as well. Now here I have a vertical line as you can see and to the left of that we find the reduction of accidents and to the right of it an increase. And the horizontal lines show the 95% confidence interval for the estimate of effect of the measures that have been listed on the left. You will see uh, right below the middle, for example, there is a very narrow confidence interval referring to periodic motor vehicle inspection. It did not have any effect or there was no change in the number of accidents associated with it. Below it, we find basic car driver training, which uh, by the way is uh, a measure for which there are several experiments. Again, you see a quite small confidence interval and it goes to both sides of zero effect. Uh, and uh, this is a general impression. There are a few examples here of uh, road safety measures that did uh, reduce accidents, uh, have been found to do so in randomized control trials, but they are a minority really. So if we apply our standard of knowledge as I explained it strictly then all we can say is about the following we did experiments with some road 20 road safety measures for most of these we did not find an effect on accidents or injuries and uh, in the few cases where we did find an effect then in uh, in most of those cases that effect was either misleading because of unsuccessful randomization. If I go back here, you, you can see in near the top of it, uh, winter speed limits with two effects indicated, one for injury accidents and one for fatal accidents. However, in that experiment, they, they formed uh, pairs of roads and randomization uh, did not succeed because the treated roads turned out to high, have a quite a higher accident rate than the untreated roads. So part of it is unfortunately likely to be regression to the mean because the roads that had speeds, uh, winter speed limits had a higher accident rate than the comparison group. In other cases, uh, they show effects that cannot be generalized or that are likely to diminish over time. The various uh, conspicuity treatments of cars like daytime running lights and high mounted brake lights are examples of this. Uh, both of them have been studied experimentally uh, and uh, the experiments show large effects, but we can see for both of them as that when the use of daytime running lights becomes uh, quite high, very common, like in 90% or more than that. And when all cars or most of them have high mounted brake lights, the effects become considerably smaller than they were in those initial experiments. And they haven't vanished completely, but they are uh, smaller than they were initially. So, if we go by the standard of experiments only, then uh, this leaves us with a couple of road safety measures that have been shown on a single location to improve road safety. So I then ask, can a more optimistic conclusion be justified? And I have to say that I certainly hope so because as you all know, I am also one of the authors of a large uh, handbook of road safety measures with more than a thousand pages and more than 100 road safety measures are described in that book. And if uh, most of that is uh, knowledge that cannot be trusted because it is not based on experimental studies, then we are in real trouble or at least I am in real trouble for having uh, misinformed the world about uh, measures that uh, really aren't effective. 
However, I, I do think uh, a more uh, optimistic picture can be painted and that some guidance in doing so can be found in this large book by Shadish Cook and Campbell, Experimental and Cross-Experimental Designs for Generalized Causal Inference. This uh, book has a long history. Uh, uh, Campbell and Stanley published the first uh, pamphlet uh, in 1963. Then uh, Cook and Campbell published a book in 1979, and then uh, Shadish joined this group, and this uh, book was published in 2002. And it uh, provides a catalog of various uh, quasi experimental designs, as they call them, and how to assess the validity of the results of studies employing such a design or such designs. To help do that, they have developed a validity framework where validity as a general concept is defined as the degree to which an inference approximates the truth. Now, of course, we can never claim or never really know that we have found the truth what we can claim and what we can know is that we don't know of any sources of error or bias that would lead us to believe that what we have found is not the truth. So that is the closest we can get. That. We, we can rule out some known sources of error and bias and the more of them we can rule out, the more closer to the truth we can hope to be. So they uh, distinguish between four types of validity, uh, statistical conclusion validity, which they defined as the validity of inferences about the correlation between a treatment and an outcome. The second type of validity they identified was uh, internal validity, which is of course uh, very central in uh, evaluation studies, and it is the validity of claiming a causal relationship between A and B. The third type of validity, they call it construct validity. And that, uh, according to their uh, definition, is the validity of inferences about the theoretical concepts based on their empirical indicators. Uh, validity of operational definitions of theoretical concepts, so to speak. And then finally, they had a category called external validity, which is the validity of generalizing study results to other contexts than those in which the study was made. You should note uh, here, uh, I probably do so as well, that this type of generalization is a, not a statistical generalization. It is a non-statistical generalization. It is not based on, on uh, various statistical techniques, but it is more like a you might call it a judgment you, you make when you review a set of studies that have been made over time and in different countries and are the contexts sufficiently different and are the results sufficiently similar. Well, if that is the case, then we might have high external validity. To apply these ideas in road safety evaluation studies, I have slightly redefine the two types of validity. The, uh, the definition that uh, Shadish Cook and Campbell gave of statistical conclusion validity is, I believe, uh, covered in internal validity because they were, were talking about the statistical relationship between a pair of variables and we are starting at least with observing a statistical relationship when we try to determine or evaluate if that is causal. So that goes into internal validity as I see it. Whereas I would uh, define statistical conclusion validity as representativeness and precision and known, known bias in estimates of effect or relationships. And then I would also uh, define theoretical validity. Uh, I replace even the term they, they refer to is as construct validity, but I prefer the term theoretical validity. Uh, and I will define that as support for a hypothesis about systematic variation in effects. 
or road safety measures. As we go along, I will try to illustrate this concept <clears throat> and how we can apply them in trying to assess the quality of knowledge we have about the effects of road safety measures. <clears throat> now, we would, of course, obviously like studies to have a high validity for all four types of validity. But uh, unfortunately, this is rarely the case for road safety evaluation studies. And that leads me to ask the question whether a study which has a low uh, validity for one of the types of validity can be uh, still be evaluated as acceptable if it has high validity for a different type. And in particular, I believe that low statistical validity which I think is common, can be compensated for by high external validity, provided external validity can be tested adequately and found to be high, that is. And also, uh, I, I believe for at least some road safety measures, perhaps not all, but some of them at least, that low internal validity, which I also think is common, can be compensated for by a high theoretical validity. Now, some years ago, Ezra and I uh, were involved in an OECD project uh, on the transferability of uh, estimates of effect and the possibility of generalizing them. And then I developed a simple uh, statistical technique, which I call the range of replications to help support uh, judgments about external validity of uh, evaluation studies. And the range of replications has uh, two dimensions, really, time and space. Time is represented by the publication year of studies. And space uh, is in most cases represented by the countries where the studies have been reported. And when both of these variables increase, then you have an increasing range of replications. That is, uh, studies that have been repeated during different years and in different countries that differ with respect at least to those two variables. Now, obviously, this is a very simple definition and simple concept because uh, the context of studies varies uh, in many other uh, respects than these, of course. You, you can have different types of traffic environments. You can have different types of groups of road users and so on and so forth. So it is really a, a multidimensional concept, but uh, to make it operational and simple, I at least started with these two dimensions only. You can uh, count uh, the number of countries and you can count the number of years and you can add them and then you get a, a statistical indicator of the range of replications. And then you can study how stable results are across that range. I think something like this is is necessary in road safety evaluation because as as ezra pointed out many years ago and as we all know many studies perhaps most of them are based on convenience samples and it is not clear if these studies are representative of any known population at all Still, if you, if you look at how such studies are presented in the scientific literature, you immediately see that statistical techniques for inference, such as uh, tests of significance or estimation of confidence intervals, they are applied. But strictly speaking, they, they, this is a crime because those techniques are based on sampling theory and sampling theory, again, is based on the assumption that the sample you study has been obtained by random sampling from a known population. 
so that every member of that population had the same probability of being sampled. And, and this is almost never the case for road safety evaluations, but still these uh, techniques based on, on sampling theory are, are widely and uncritically applied. And there is probably no chance of, of, uh, of stopping that uh, practice. So what we can do then is, uh, is to see if the findings of studies have been replicated over time and in different uh, set study settings. And, uh, and my thinking about that is that that in, in some sense then compensates for the fact that we know very little about how the samples of the individual studies were obtained. We only know that they are all of them or nearly all of them convenience samples. Those were the data that the researcher ha happened to get his hand on. And um, then, of course, statistical generalization is difficult. But uh, we can ha have a look at uh, external validity. And uh, I did so in that OECD study for uh, road lighting. It, it is a very fortunate case because it has been evaluated during a long period. When I looked at this some years ago, I had studies uh, stretching a period of 61 years from 1948 until 2009. And I had studies that had been made in 13 different countries. And so uh, I, I did uh, what is uh, called a cumulative meta-analysis. And a cumulative meta-analysis is very simple. You first summarize the first two studies, then the first three, then the first four, and, and so on, adding one more at a time. And then you see if the summary estimate of effect changes as you add new studies. And in particular, of course, if you in this case, if you add new countries. As you can see by this uh, curve in the middle here, goes uh, slightly up and down, but uh, it, it, is, it remains very close to an accident modification factor of 0.7 or 30% accident reduction. The confidence interval, of course, becomes smaller as the statistical weights of the studies increase. In this case, I had uh, 35 replications because it's only a replication with, which differs by being made in a different country or by being made in a different year that adds to that range. If, if something is repeated in the same country or repeated in the same year, I, I don't uh, count it in this case as a replication. It has to be a different context, either in terms of the year, in terms of the country, or in terms of both of them. Because then, uh, we can see if, if that difference in context makes a difference for the results. And in this case, it, it didn't. Now, coming to uh, theoretical perspectives, I would say that uh, road safety evaluation research in, in general is not uh, based on a strong theoretical foundation. But it could be based on a more well-formulated theoretical foundation than it actually is. And there are very many cases, I think, where we can formulate what I here refer to as low-level theory about the effects of road safety measures. Now, of course, uh, there is a long tradition, uh, in particular in sociology, of, of making a distinction between different levels of theory formulation. And uh, broadly speaking, there are three levels. You have uh, at the uppermost level, grand or universal theory. We, we, I would say we don't fi find that in the social sciences, but we do find it uh, in natural science. We, we do find it in biology and engineering. And we have, laws of nature like uh, gravity, the speed of light, the gas law, uh, whatever. The only attempt unsuccessful in my opinion to formulate a theory at this level uh, in our field of study is Wilde's theory of risk homeostasis. But I regard that 
different <coughs> theory as, uh, as uh, tautological. It is true by definition and incapable of empirical testing and therefore also incapable of guiding research since it cannot be falsified. Now, the next level is intermediate level theory and we don't really have uh, much of that either, but uh, I would say that the theory is aiming to explain under what conditions uh, a cause produces its intended effect is an example of an intermediate level theory. We may ask then uh, under what conditions would the road safety measure be effective? And then finally, at the lowest level, we have low level theory and that uh, theory at that level refers only to the effects of a single road safety measure by specifying systematic variation in the effects of that measure by specifying a systematic pattern that we may expect to observe or that we can hypothesize about. And if we observe that, it can give us some confidence that what we have found is effects of the road safety measure and not effects of some uncontrolled confounding factor or something different. I, I had a paper in accident analysis uh, and prevention in 2004. Uh, to what extent can theory uh, account for the findings of road safety evaluation study? It's perhaps a kind of intermediate level theory. It is very closely related to uh, Leonard Evans and his uh, thinking about these matters. Of course, I was inspired by him and his uh, distinction between an engineering effect and a behavioral effect. And you can formulate based on this simple model, a very general condition for a road safety measure to be effective. First, it should influence some target risk factors that are actually increasing the risk of accidents or injuries. And second, the behavioral adaptation should not be so large as to eliminate or entirely offset the effect on the target risk factors. The difficulty, of course, is to predict the behavioral adaptation and uh, we still have some way to go to be able to predict that very well, but it can be well, some of the conditions for behavioral adaptations are, are known, I think. So we may perhaps in some cases predict it. Now, we understand, of course, that as a rule, I would say, the effects of road safety measures vary. Now, traditionally, and the handbook of road safety measures is clearly an example of that. Traditionally, it has been presented as one or a set of point estimates. I mean, going back to the example of road lighting, it would say that, well, the road lighting reduces injury accidents in darkness by 30%. But of course, we know it is, it is not as simple as that. It varies systematically, and my idea is that we can, if we can model this variation, if we are able to formulate a hypothesis about it, that gives us some support when we are interpreting the results of evaluation studies and, and trying to figure out if those results are merely confounding bias through data or, or other sources of error, or whether they may reasonably be uh, interpreted to at least partially show the effects of road safety measures. Now, however, if we are to do this, I think that we should impose one restriction or one assumption, which is that the evaluation studies are what I will, would call robust with respect to confounding. And I would define that as follows. Results are robust with respect to confounding. If studies controlling for different confounding factors get the same or similar results. 
And, and this is uh, useful because when results are robust against confounding, then we need not worry so much about that when we are developing models of variation in defects of road safety measures. And in my experience in doing various meta-analysis and in summarizing the results of many, many studies about the effects of road safety measures. In my experience, I would say that the results are likely to be robust to confounding when the mechanism producing their effects are, is closely related to the laws of physics. The closer it is related to that, the, the more the laws of physics uh, shine through, so to speak. They, they, uh, they are the laws of physics are, if I can say so, strong enough to defeat any confounding factor. They, they, uh, they shine through every design. And, and road uh, lighting is one example. There are various designs here, various before and after designs, various case control designs. And all of these designs are poor. And when these, uh, when these studies were entered some 15, 20 years ago into the highway safety manual, there was a procedure for uh, entering them into the highway safety manual and uh, assigning a quality score to them. And I was involved in that work. And, and uh, if I remember it correctly, all, all, all studies, all evaluations, <laughs> Overall safety, overall lighting were rated as low quality. So that was uh, how we rated them. Uh, and uh, so given that fact, uh, can we still trust them? Well, what you see here at least is that the results don't vary a lot depending on study design. The, 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 these uh, six study designs uh, don't seem to matter a lot. So based on that, uh, I developed, or I and a colleague of mine, we developed uh, 10 hypotheses about systematic variation in the effects of road lighting. Now, first of all, all of course, uh, we, we have a global hypothesis, which is that uh, accidents in darkness are reduced because we know that darkness increases risk. But then, in addition to that global hypothesis, more specific hypothesis can be formulated easily. Uh, there is a transition period, of course, between uh, daylight and darkness, which we call twilight. And we would expect larger effects in da darkness than in twilight. Then it isn't equally dark everywhere. I mean, if the road is located in a valley, in a forest with high trees near to the road, it will be much darker at night on that road than on a road which is located in a more open landscape. So we might expect there to be a higher share of accidents in darkness. And then the potential for road lighting is larger. So when there is a high share of accidents in darkness, we would expect it to have a higher effect than if there is a lower share. And then, of course, the, the chief mechanism by which road lighting uh, operates is that it increases detection distances. You can see uh, objects or road uses at a larger distance than you could without road lighting. And you have more time to react. And, well, sometimes you, you can react sufficiently to prevent the accident from occurring at all. But at other times it, it still occurs, but at a smaller impact speed. So we would expect there to be a severity gradient. Uh, you would have the largest effect for fatal accidents and smaller for injury accidents and still smaller for property damage accidents. And then of course, uh, small road users like pedestrians and cyclists are less visible in the darkness than, than a car. Cars have headlights and, and uh, are large objects and a, a cycle might have some reflective devices or, or a headlight and a taillight. A pedestrian might wear some reflective device as well, but most pedestrians don't. 
and most uh, cyclists are poorly lit up. So we would expect a larger effect for those road user groups than for motorists. And then of course, uh, the, the quality of lighting varies the intensity of it. Uh, if it's high intensity lighting, we would expect a larger effect than if it's a, a lower level. And then uh, when energy is expensive, uh, lights get switched off to conserve energy. And when they do so, you would expect the effect to go the other direction. You would expect an increase in accent when lighting is reduced or switched off completely. Then lighting can be more or less uniform. You could have some dark areas in between some uh, lit up spots. And if you have that, of course, in those darker areas, there could be road users or objects that would be more difficult to see than if there is a uniform level of lighting. So uh, the more uniform it is, the better and the higher effect. And then also we had two hypotheses regarding variation with respect to the type of traffic environment, smaller effect on motorways than elsewhere and a smaller effect in urban areas than elsewhere. The latter hypothesis is because there are other sources of artificial lighting in urban areas. There are buildings that are lit up and so on. So in a city, in a town, it is not as dark as it is in the countryside. Now, we did two meta-analysis or compared the results of two meta-analysis to evaluate these hypotheses, and most of them were supported. Not all, but some seven or eight of these hypotheses got support, and that uh, it's not so bad. And it, it tells me at least that the, probably what these studies found, even if they didn't control uh, very well for confounding factors, is they, they, they really found an effect of road lighting. I can give you one example here. Uh, there are some studies that have, have uh, compared different levels of luminous or, or, or illuminance. This is actually a bit tricky to compare at the international level because uh, levels of luminance are measured differently in North America and in Europe because in North America, the measure is the, the amount of light emitted by the source. That is uh, how, how strong is the, the source of lighting? How much light does it emit? Whereas in Europe, this is measured by re reflection how many candela are reflected from the road surface per square meter. And those two ways of measuring uh, the amount of lighting are, aren't really comparable and cannot easily convert it uh, from one to the other. So to circumvent that problem, uh, I, I defined what I call the relative level of illuminance. So that the lowest level in any single study has a value of one and then you have increasing levels. And actually, but by looking carefully at these curves, they do form two clusters. It's not so obvious here, maybe. But when you then merge the studies in each cluster, you get the picture like this, which is very systematic and nice, I think. You see that when the initial share of accidents in darkness was around 50%, then increasing uh, luminance level did reduce that share to something lower. Whereas when it was only 25%, the curve was essentially flat. So to get to a conclusion now, assessing knowledge is I think a balancing act. I, I think it would be too dogmatic and, uh, or, or too general to reject all observational uh, or non-experimental studies simply because they are non-experimental. Non uh, of course, experimental studies are better, but the fact that the study is observational is by itself not a sufficient reason, I think, for rejecting it. We will be rejecting very many studies if we follow that as a rule. But on the other hand, it would be too uncritical to ac accept all results of observational studies to, to just take them uncritically at face value. 
certainly some of those uh, results are erroneous and should be rejected. And our task is then, uh, how can we find the middle road between these two extremes, between accepting everything and rejecting everything, uh, both of which are wrong in my opinion. And the middle road, as I see it, as, and as you will understand from my presentation, is we should critically assess validity. We should apply these uh, criteria of validity systematically, and we should look for signs, both in a single study and in a set of studies, so we look for signs both of high and low validity. And, and normally we, we can find both of those. So, 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 so that also means that in most cases, it is possible to argue uh, both for rejecting studies and for believing in them. Yet, the fact that our field is an applied field uh, in a sense, forces our hands, so to speak. Now, as researchers and in our, our role as researchers, we should, I think, call for more experiments. If, if a highway agency or a car manufacturer or, or whatever approaches us and wants us to do research for them, then whenever we, we see a possibility of, of proposing a, an experiment and getting approval for that, we should do so. And I think there are more opportunities for experiments than have been made so far. Uh, it, it could have been done more often than historically has been the case. And the second uh, thing you know, we know as researchers, of course, is that we are uh, very unlikely to undermine our uh, way of living by saying that our work has been finished by saying that we have now reached uh, perfect knowledge and there is no further need for research. No researcher will ever say that. But this is where I, where I think we come to the point where our role as applied researchers, as I said, forces our hand because practitioners, the, the users of our research, they cannot afford to wait until perfect knowledge arrives. They, they must act now based on, on the current imperfect knowledge. And that, in a sense, means that they have to accept that knowledge. I mean, if you decide to put up road lighting, then you have, by doing so, uh, accepted the, the results of research, in, in a sense. You, you have accepted that this is good for something. It, it is good for mobility, maybe it is good for preventing crime, it is good in preventing accident, but at least it's, it's good for something. If that were not the fact, it would make no sense for you as a practitioner to put up road lighting. Uh, similarly, if you uh, reconstruct a, an intersection into a roundabout, you, you have already accepted that there, that there must be some, some benefits associated with roundabouts, otherwise, uh, you wouldn't do it. So while we, we should be, be critical, we, we have to perhaps approach uh, practitioners a little bit differently because we do not guide them wisely, I think, if we only say that our knowledge is not to be trusted. And that means if we say, if that is what we tell practitioners, they will uh, say, well, if that's the case, then we are not going to fund any research anymore because uh, what you find out is uh, cannot be trusted anyway. And if it cannot be trusted, then we'll uh, figure out on our own what we believe is effective and uh, make our own prejudices the basis of our decisions. So we, we, we should, I think, uh, at least say <laughs> that some of our results can be trusted when we are dealing with protectionists. Thank you. Thank you, Rune. And it's very nice to know that uh, in general, we can say that some of our results are to be trusted. I guess there will be some questions and comments. Thank you anyway for that interesting uh, insights. And before we go to
to the Q&A session, I would like to tell or to um, make a little bit of publicity for the next ICTCT events. After all, it's a free webinar, so you should accept a little bit of uh, advertisements in between, but we'll keep it short. So uh, at the end of October, 27, 28 October, there is the annual ICTCT conference, this time in Gyur in Hungary. The registrations um, will be open as of next week. We will uh, send around um, a newsletter from ICTCT, so keep your mailbox um, watched and um, uh, don't forget to register for the conference, the first uh, a live conference in a couple of years. So one reason more to be there. And uh, Gyur is not just an interesting location for a conference, but also a nice uh, city, we believe, to visit. Related to that conference, there will also be a um, the annual traffic safety researchers course in which uh, Runa, by the way, will be one of the lecturers. So also a good reason to be there as an early career researcher, but also for peop people that have some experience that are maybe rather new to the field or are already quite a while in the field. Always good to have some uh, lectures and interactions with uh, a few people that have been around for many years. Uh, the traffic safety researchers course is already open for registration, so please go to the ICTCT website and register there. And then um, save the date already for the next webinar that will be uh, on the December 2 webinar with uh, Aaron Schwab, who is an uh, emeritus professor at the TU Delft in the Netherlands, and he will be talking about both the art and the science of cycling and implications of both on road safety. So please uh, note that already in your agenda. Good, and after having uh, said this, back to the session from uh, Runa Elvik. I'll try to unshare my screen and move to Alexei Lorishin, who will be the moderator for the questions and answers. Please, Alexei. Yeah. Uh, so to get some order in this, I would ask you to just write your name in the chat and I will take, a, like you will get a chance to speak in that order as the names appear in the chat. So we are all in one meeting. Uh, we can talk simultaneously. You can unmute yourself. You can show your video, but we don't want several people talking simultaneously. So please use the chat function to, to make a queue. Hello, Rene. Thanks for the presentation. Um, maybe one obvious question about, uh, of course, the, the superiority of a randomized uh, on uh, control, control trials or experiments is that it's, I mean, the usual caveat is that it's hard to do it, but safety, it's expensive. We can't do it everywhere. And so what, what, what is your opinion on some treatments which we cannot really randomize or which would be too expensive, or et cetera? Uh, yeah, well, I... Uh... I think uh, large uh, infrastructure measures. I mean, uh, you, you don't experimentally build a, a six-lane motorway. You, you don't do that. Uh, and um, but but uh, it, it has mostly been applied uh, to uh, road user-related measures, in particular training and campaigns and so on and uh, also to some minor uh, road treatments like uh, delineator posts, uh, edge lines and so on, but it could be uh, applied uh, to other measures as well. It, it, it could actually also be applied, I think, to, to road lighting. Now, of course, there is an investment. Uh, road lighting does not come for free. It, it costs something, but once you have road lighting, you could experimentally switch it on and off and see what happens. Thank you. 
Uh, I have a question here from Sharon Spence. Can you maybe just tell it yourself? Well, the, the question is related to uh, the safety of roundabouts in different countries. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, no yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, well, yes, uh, roundabouts. Uh, I, I have reviewed studies about roundabouts twice. Uh, I once did it around 2000 and I reviewed the non US studies because at that time there was some discussion in the US about whether to introduce uh, roundabouts uh, or not. And, uh, and the Federal Highway Administration did a study tour around the world and, and uh, gathered evidence or experience from countries that had widely applied the roundabouts, uh, Great Britain, France, Germany, and so on. And then uh, about 15 years uh, later, I updated that and then I included more recent studies. And, Roundabout is, I think, very similar to road lighting in that you can easily think of, of uh, uh, physical reasons why it should be effective because uh, it is uh, most basically a speed reducing device uh, and everything that reduces speed, I believe, uh, should be expected to improve safety. And uh, also it eliminates uh, conflict points uh, and some of them are quite dangerous like turning left uh, in front of oncoming traffic. Uh, and uh, the design of the round what eliminates that particular type of conflict. Uh, and uh, since basically all cars in the roundabout uh, move in the same direction, then uh, collision angles are also different and much sharper and, and the energy involved in any collision is much smaller than if, if the cars crash at right angle or, or head on. So, so uh, one can easily think of, of uh, maybe not 10 hypotheses, but if five, six, seven hypotheses about systematic variation in the effects of roundabouts and test those hypotheses by means of, of evaluation studies. Yeah, okay, thank you. Per Goder? Yes, I have a couple of very detailed questions. Can you hear me, Rune? Yes. Uh, about road lighting. You showed uh, a slide with uh, the effect being the same in every study. And you said there were 35 studies, but you also number the studies from one to 13. Uh, so uh, uh, what are the numbers? Yeah. That you have? There, were, uh, there were 35 replications. There are uh, more than uh, 35 studies. I mean, I did... Um, the first time I came to the TRB, I presented a meta-analysis and that included 37 studies. And my colleague, Alena Höye, made another meta-analysis last year and it included 35 studies. And those were totally different. So we can add the numbers and get 72 studies in total of road lighting. And did you say the, the, that- The 13, there were 30, that was just the count of countries. There were 13 different countries. So you do include a new study from the same country. It was unclear to me. No. Like if the US. Uh, yeah, I include it if it is a different year. I mean, if you had one US study in 1948 and, uh, and another US study in 1962, I would include it. But if you had two US studies in 1962, I would include only one of them in the range of replications. That is, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Jürgen Gerlach. Yeah, thanks Rune for that uh, wonderful presentation. What I am asking me is um, when an accident appears, it has so many different causes. And even if I look on the um, possible causes you have in urban areas and in urban main roads, 
We are wondering in Germany at the moment uh, whether we can find models to forecast the accidents because all those influence like um, how many pedestrians are there who would like to cross, um, how many cyclists do you have. We don't have these data and um, it, it you have so many influences like um, what, what do you have to pay in a country if you are over speeding, for example, in Norway, you nearly yeah. get imprisoned. In mm. Germany, you have to pay only 100 euro. How can you put it into the model and then focus on, on one aspect? Uh, you, you raise some, some big issues, really. But, uh, well, <laughs> if we... First of all, talk about uh, multivariate statistical models, accident prediction models. Uh, lots of research has gone into that in the last uh, 25 years, and uh, and they are getting more and more statistically sophisticated and advanced, and so on. And, but I, I, I don't think those models are worthless. I, I wouldn't say so. They, 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 some of some of the coefficients, some of the findings are valid, but it's the same as for road safety evaluations, there is variability. Some of the findings you can trust and others you, you really cannot. And we should recognize, I think, that every such model will have omitted variables and potentially omitted variable bias. You can easily include in those models permanent characteristics or, or comparatively permanent characteristics such as uh, traffic volume, uh, horizontal curve radius, number of lanes, uh, speed limit, uh, gradient of the road, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, including road user behavior is uh, nearly impossible, possibly with the exception of speed. Uh, I've seen a few models where speed is a variable, but apart from that, uh, other aspects of behavior are, are almost impossible to include. Now, when, when you, you talk about accident causation, I have uh, exactly the same point of view on that matter as Ezra explains in his uh, most recent paper in accident analysis and prevention called Crash Causation and Prevention, which is a masterpiece, I think, and clarifies things and, and really clears up all the muddled thinking and, and erroneous thinking that has been about that subject for many, many years. Uh, and then um, the, the chief cause of any accident will be a, a missing road safety measure because you can make, always make lists of of, uh, of road user related factors. The, the road user was speeding, he was not paying attention, he didn't brake when he was supposed to brake uh, and so on and so forth. But in many cases, including the example that uh, Ezra uses in the paper, you can drop even longer lists of road safety measures that are uh, not implemented, that could have been implemented at a location and could have made a difference if they had been implemented. And it is relevant to think about that and it is relevant to include them because if the purpose of studying accident causation is to get some control. If, if the purpose is prevention, well, then immediately it follows that everything that can prevent is also relevant. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, we are reaching actually the scheduled time, but I still have some questions here in chat. So I would suggest we take, uh, do, 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 let me see, we have two more questions. Uh, we take that and that would be the end. Uh, so the, the first one is from Diana Gonsalves. Uh, would, you, would you say it, your question? Diana? Okay, I listen to you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my question is uh, the fog in the file uh, is taken in consideration when you take some measure because it's also know that 
methane and this phosphine uh, cause some kind of fluorescent uh, file uh, in some in some rows here in in Argentina and I guess in another country could could do the same. Uh, or are you using the factors on some kind of computer simulation uh, to take those measures? Well, well, what I presented here today in, in the lecture was, was based uh, mostly on meta-analysis. And meta-analysis is uh, methods for statistically summarizing and synthesizing the results of a number of studies. And so uh, with respect to role lighting, uh, I based myself on two such uh, analyses, one in 1995 and the other one in, in 2021 last year. And, and um, the examples uh, about randomized control trials that I had at the beginning were based on, on a paper I had in accident analysis and prevention last year where I tried to compile uh, a complete list of, of randomized control trials. I, I, I don't know if I was able to do that, of course, but at least the, the ones that I, I knew of are, are, are included there. So uh, that was the, the, the basis of what I said, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Raspal, Thank you. please. Thomas? Uh, hi, um, good morning here in Buenos Aires. I would like to know if there is any studies about the results of different strategies and measures for preventing accidents in situations of low visibility, like a, a meta-analysis like the one you have done recently, but uh, regarding driving in, in low visibility conditions. Yeah, I can see here in the chat that you are referring to, to fog uh, in particular. Uh, yes, uh, I have seen a few studies evaluating the effects of fog warning systems and, uh, and um, they, they are summarized, I think, in the, in the handbook of road safety measures. But uh, Regrettably, in this case, I, I have to say that uh, they're probably exaggerating the effects. I am not saying that it is ineffective, but these are simple before and after studies. And uh, I strongly suspect that there is some regression to the mean bias in them. Uh, hopefully, the, that regression to the mean is not large enough to eliminate the effect. but but. Basically, we don't know that, and if the study doesn't control for it, we, we are left in the dark, more or less. But uh, I would say that uh, the, those studies that I've seen probably exaggerate the effect of fog warnings. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now we have a question from Mohamed Gavidel. Hello and good morning. Thank you for your presentation. It was very, very, very good. Uh, I have a question about uh, there is a saying that the expectation experiment is better than the observation because you can have a, a control on your whatever you are doing. Uh, but I'm what I'm uh, thinking about is the when you are designing an experiment, there is a, some bias because when if you doing the first experiment, the other experiment is come up to just the. Uh, other version of the same experience. Is there is there any bias in these experiments? And then you are working with the observation. Uh, I think it's more uh, related to a real world situation, but it's more- Yeah, yeah well, yes, the, 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 there could be a bias in experiments, certainly. Uh, and uh, there could be unintended behavioral adaptation of, of, from the experimental subjects as well. And there is even a name for it. It's called the Hawthorne effect. And it was detected in some industrial experiments that were made in, in the United States uh, way back in the 1920s and 1930s. I think they were 
experimenting with the factories with the, the temperature in there the, the level of lighting and so on and at the end of the every time they made the change the workers became more productive and at the end they, they switched off all lights and switched off all heating so the, the, the it was a dark room dark and cold room and productivity set new records and then of course they understood that something had gone wrong uh, and that uh, it, it couldn't really be the case that having a cold and dark room was favorable to productivity but uh, but yes you 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 are also right i think that uh, if if experiments uh, copy one another you experiment two, two is an exact copy of experiment one they, they could uh, repeat errors if there is an error in them but th there are various ways uh, to to test for for uh, unintended effects uh, like this hawthorne effect they, they did discover it eventually and and it has been known ever since that time uh, and there, there is a, in medicine, you have something similar, which you have probably heard of. It's called the placebo effect. You give people uh, sugar pills instead of giving them proper medicine and they improve because they believe they are being treated for an illness, whereas they are only being fooled, of course. But, but they have developed methods in medicine to, to reveal these effects and to have what they call placebo controlled randomized trials. And uh, so, so these techniques exist. They, they are out there in the literature and we could do something similar in road safety. I'm quite sure of it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank okay. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. And yeah, well, we, we do really not have time to take all of them. I see Stan has a very interesting question, but maybe during the ICTCT conference. Well, we uh, pe pe people <laughs> uh, can uh, always uh, mail questions to me, of course, and uh, I I will not answer them now right after the meeting because uh, now I'm going home, but I can answer them later if you have questions and comments. Uh, so please uh, mail me and I'll, I'll try to answer it. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, Stain, would you say a couple of words at the end? Yes, very shortly. So I will invite everyone to join us at the ICTCT conference where Una will also be. So uh, if there are further questions or discussion points, they can be discussed uh, then and there. Thank you all for attending this webinar. Thank you, of course, Una, to uh, give this lecture. We all enjoyed it, I think. Enjoy the rest of the day and the weekend and see you soon back at one of our activities. Bye-bye. Thank you.